Happy New Year. Welcome back. Thank you. I'm pretty excited. I made it till halftime of the national championship game last night. Woke up and saw that the Tigers won. You get that? Yeah. My brother's a LSU alum, so I was happy that they that they won. And, and my friend Lori here is a Clemson alum, so we're going to take it easy on her today. Um, yeah. Uh, well, one, two real quick things, now we're going to get rolling here. If any of you snuck in the side doors, and this is for faculty, please go and scan in so we can get you the, what you need for your recertification. Um, second is there's a lot of confusion. Yesterday on the portal there was an announcement from Kalen that there is a presidential um, what statement, announcement, whatever the word was, at 2 o'clock tomorrow. She will be at the last 10 minutes of the morning in service tomorrow with us and the first 10 minutes of the afternoon in service with us. So you guys, please go wherever you're supposed to be for in service because you'll hear everything that she's going to do at 2 o'clock in here. Okay? Awesome. I want to uh, start today with a couple updates on some of the things that have happened over the course of the fall semester, moving into the spring, and then move into what we're going to do over the next two days um, as part of our continued work around the academic calendar. First, um, and this is awesome, I didn't know if it was going to happen, but it did. All of the program changes are done. Good job. All the program maps are done. That's awesome. We launched Explorance Blue. What is Explorance Blue, you ask? <laughs> Our course evaluation tool. It's the first time in the history of this college that we have an automated system for course evaluation that can give you trend data for yourself, for your department, for your school, and for the college as a whole. And we don't have to have somebody spend a bunch of time typing up all the comments. It's awesome. And we had about a 50%, 50-ish percent response rate for students, which was higher than we had expected for an online platform. So thank you for taking the time to have your students go and fill those out. Interestingly enough, and I don't know if Randy is in here, but the percentage of students filling that out on a mobile device was through the roof. So it's a mobile platform to begin with, which was really cool. Finally, and this one I'm super excited about, and I know Rachel Burling is too. This is the first time, maybe ever, but we'll say in a very long time, that she was able to run all the end of term processing with all the credit grades submitted. That's huge. Be happy. <laughs> what that means is that there were no late grades submitted this past fall. That's going to be of critical importance as we move forward in this calendar to be able to run our end of term processing in a shorter time frame. So thank you for your work on that. So in November, we spent a lot of time helping you, helping us get ready for the launch of our calendar. We focused the time on course conversion and walking through what that might look like. Some of you have done it. You've been teaching in that format for a long time. Some of you are brand new to it. And so that faculty sub-team of the calendar did an awesome job of putting together those two days. Today and tomorrow is a continuation of that work. I looked at, as did that committee, all of the feedback from November. I read every single comment, everything from in-service sucks to we love the mini muffins to thanks this is the best in-service ever and everything in between. Seriously. Who loves the mini muffins? <laughs> I 
So today you're going to see, today and tomorrow, the result of some of that feedback. You asked for a repeat of some of the very popular breakout sessions in November. And so some of those are being repeated today. You asked for another faculty panel. We're going to get that very soon. You asked for a student panel. You're going to get that tomorrow. You asked for more faculty talking about their stories. So tomorrow, in addition to the faculty panel today, there'll be a faculty forum tomorrow morning. So you have an opportunity to engage in a smaller setting, talking to faculty who have been through this process. You asked for time to work. So we've built in supported work time into this schedule. And that supported work time is for you to be able to spend some focused time on course conversion and or the integration of the new critical life skills rubric. And there's some sessions for that tomorrow. I would ask that you use that time for those. You ask for time to work on conversions, we've provided it. Please use it. One additional recurring theme that came out of the comments was, and this uh, happened, uh, I read this multiple times, was a number of distractions and breakout sessions. So I'm going to respectfully ask that you limit your distractions to the extent possible. Your colleagues, not me, your colleagues, your faculty colleagues have spent an incredible amount of time putting together these two days. And as much as we get irritated by students doing that type of thing in our classrooms, your colleagues notice it as well. One thing we're adding to this in-service, and we're super excited to be able to do this, is bring in two experts with a ton of street cred. <laughs> we have two individuals here who will introduce after the faculty panel from Achieve the Dream. Achieve the Dream is an organization focused on equity and completion and helps many institutions as they work through getting students to that end goal through the guided pathways processes that we're working on. And through a grant that we have, we were able to bring in two incredible people to help us. I'm not going to tell you their backgrounds quite yet. Before I make my final comments, I want to take an, a minute to thank Nicole, who's leaving WCTC, as all of you know, for all of the blood, sweat, and tears that she's given this college and the leadership on a lot of the work that we're doing, in particular the Guided Pathways and the work around this calendar, but also a lot of processes and student-facing things out of student services. As you know, she's been my partner in crime since I trans transitioned into this role. Absolutely my best friend at work. She will be greatly missed at this institution. We will continue to move forward in her absence. But thank you for everything. You've been awesome. I want to thank the faculty development team, the calendar steering team, and everyone else that's been involved in assisting and planning these two days. I had a, uh, that's where my notes end. I had somebody at the uh, college who's told me on multiple occasions, uh, somebody I have a tremendous amount of respect for, say, you know, Brad, don't read, talk. Speak from the heart. So I found one on Amazon Prime, and I got it over Christmas, and I've installed it. <laughs> and I'm going to try it out. They have a great return policy if this doesn't work. So. 
I have spent, I turned 50 this past May. I know that's hard to believe, right? You can say that's hard to believe if you want. But, uh, I've spent half my life in higher ed. It was about my 24th, 25th year in higher ed. I believe in the power of education. I believe in the incredible responsibility that those of us who work in higher ed, whether it's four year, but in particular two year, because the impact is so important. Damn it, I forgot to introduce new faculty. <laughs> We're gonna stop there. Jim, edit that, damn it, thinks he I did it again. I'm gonna come back to that in one second. Who's uh, new faculty? We, I know we have a few here. Where are you? Can you tell us who you are and what you're doing? Thank you, welcome. Welcome. Any other? Le oh, level four. Okay, <laughs> fancy. Welcome. That's a fancy word for the flu. <laughs> That's what I've learned. Thank you. So anyway, I believe in the power and the magnitude of the responsibility that we have as two-year colleges in helping individuals get to where they need to go. And when I talk to new faculty, whether they're full-time or adjunct, I always remind them of what we are in the business of. You've heard me say this a million times. We're not in the business of delivering courses. We're in the business of changing lives. All of you have been to a commencement ceremony, and I would love to hear one individual that isn't moved every single time. I get a unique perspective sitting up there, so I get to see the, the joy on their faces. This time I got to shake everyone's hand as they came across the stage and give them their diploma. And that's cool. And I would like to say that I have had a tremendous impact personally on every single one of them, and I know I haven't. But you have. I can't tell you how proud I am of our work. I can't thank you enough for all that you've done and continue to do. If I had a dime for every time I saw an interaction between a faculty member and a student outside that classroom or that lab, I'd have a lot of damn dimes. I spent a lot of time walking around this fall. You may not believe that, but I've been out of my office as much as I possibly can, sitting in different places, working in different places, having conversations with people. But I'm also an introvert, so I spend a lot of time just ob observing. And it's fascinating to watch. I was talking to a student yesterday in the hub. Maybe he was more talking to me, I'm not sure promising me that he was going to do better at DECA state champions or state competition this year. I'm like, that's cool. I thought you just graduated. He's coming back. The impact is, Ed, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> the impact is real. And while this change we're in the midst of right now is anything but easy, there's a reason for it. We're all here to help students succeed, to help them meet their goals. 
and that's what we're going to continue to do. So I want to thank all of you from the bottom of my Amazon heart <laughs> for everything you've done to help us, help our students. Keep up the good work. We will get through this together. Thank you. Brenda, it's yours. So now we're going to transition to the faculty panel. And I have the privilege of being the moderator of uh, the panel. So what we'll do is we'll get started here um, so that we can get a lot of comments from each of the, these faculty members that have agreed to share their experiences. So we're going to start by asking each of the panel members to first introduce themselves and then tell you about their experiences with alternate uh, course delivery like the eight-week week, uh, course um, conversion that we're moving toward and um, you know, just a little bit of background about that experience. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I'm Jennifer Cole. I teach early childhood education. I have had a variety of experiences teaching in alternate delivery modes. Um, this is my seventh cohort in blended options. So that's a hybrid flipped learning environment. I also teach May term and J term classes, which is what the old terminology was for those short little interims that occur between semesters. Um, for example, right now I'm teaching a J term class and the model for that is, if you look at an old 16 week class, we're doing um, 16 days instead of 16 weeks. We're condensing that into eight modules. So they do a module every other day and they are doing extremely well in that course right now. Hi, I'm Melissa Siemenson. Can you hear me? Um, and I teach in the IT areas. Um, I've been here um, 19 years, and I am currently serving on the steering team and the faculty team, so I've been very much a part of this process. Um, <clears throat> and my experience is, I, I think it was about three or four years ago, um, we started doing conversions in the School of Business. So uh, uh, IT and some of the School of Business programs began their conversions. And um, all of my courses are hybrid courses. When I did the conversions, we converted them all to hybrid. I leverage a lot of Canvas and online tools. Being in IT, I can do that um, with my students. And I learned that um, when I started the conversions, did a lot of the just taking the 16-week content and chunking it into eight weeks, and I learned that that did not work. So um, I've kind of turned uh, my, my focus into um, focusing on the competency. So if you attended any of the breakout sessions that I was a part of in November, that was a big theme of, of how I do things. So not so much competency-based, but focusing on the competency and driving the, all of the activities and the materials and the assessments toward that. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Carrie Pirock. I teach in the Foundations of Teacher Education program here on campus. Um, we converted our program from 16-week traditional to the eight-week hybrid format about four years ago. Um, and I thought it would be a hard sell for students, but they really, really enjoyed it and really felt success at a quicker rate. Um, the one thing that just came up yesterday, I was looking at my feedback from the course evals, and two students said, I feel like I learned more in the online portion of the class than the face-to-face. And at first, I was like, oh, well, I need to think about this. Why aren't they feeling like they're learning when they come to class? But then I realized in a true flipped classroom, what we're doing in the classroom a lot of times doesn't feel like learning. You know, the active scenarios and the things they're doing, where they're getting the background knowledge before they come to class in my program. They do the pre-work. So I think that's a kind of a win, because I was thinking they're coming to class, they're doing a lot of active learning, and they're not seeing it as necessarily um, as much of the intense learning that they're reading about at home in the pre-work. Good morning. My name is Corey Wanick. I teach economics. And 
for many years, we've been taking the econ class into the eight-week summer class and just comp compressing it. That can work, but our success rates in the summer, especially online, were not very high. We just kind of said, well, that's just how the course is, and the students need to adapt and do better with it. But over time, the success rates even went down, and so we had to make a change with that. As many of you know, I also teach in uh, Vienna, Austria. I, I take students over there, and when I teach there, because we have such a compressed time frame, I have classes that are six hours long, five days in a row. And I think, I say to my students, the only thing better than six hours of econ is seven hours of econ, but we can't do that today. <laughs> but in that case, I need to interact with the students. I can't lecture the whole time. I need to have activities and such. And so I took those ideas and I brought them here, and I do more of that in the classroom here now too. So my work is not only with students face-to-face, -face, but online and in hybrid, and finding the best ways for them to learn with those different modalities is what I'm focusing on. Uh, good morning. My name is Brenda Wolf. I teach in the Quality Management Program in the School of Business. Uh, my experience with the alternative delivery modes really focused really on what we call the blended options accelerated format. I had been doing that since 2011. Um, we had been teaching three credit courses in a six-week time frame in um, most of my courses, as well as I have a five-credit course that I condensed down as well into a 14-week course with an added one credit that gets um, taught in a two-week format, so adding uh, six credits worth of work into 16 weeks. Uh, my biggest challenge has been um, trying to find the balance between what is the most appropriate um, learning activity to push outside of um, the actual face-to-face -face time and making sure that our face-to-face -face time is most meaningful. Um, so taking all that content and then finding that balance between the two. Um, and that's, that's where my focus has been and now it's actually kind of a luxury to have two additional weeks to add into the six-week format now to have the eight. So I'm actually looking forward to having the eight weeks now. Excellent. So now we're going to have several questions answered just by some of the faculty on the panels. So we'll start with Corey and ask him to share with us what he does uh, instead of lecturing to help get the material out to the students. It's been a long time since I actually did any kind of lecturing. And when I did lecturing before, it was mostly with PowerPoint and talking through the slides and things like that. I, don't, I can't remember the last time I actually sat or sat, stood and lectured. Almost all my class time is they come in and we work on problems and economic questions we're trying to solve. And how do you go about solving them? And having the students share how they went about it and work with groups to do those kinds of things. Now, how do I get the material to them? Almost all of it's learned online. Even my fully face-to-face -face classes, my students have online learning to do before they come to class. My biggest challenge is, has been to what do I make them do? What do I have them do to prepare? At first, it was like, oh, the, the PowerPoints. If you watch the Cedar PowerPoint before, they'll be ready. Not quite. Oh, the videos. If you have videos, they'll have them ready. Not quite. The book reps are like, hey, if you have questions they do ahead of time, that'll have them ready. Not quite. Oh, we now have interactive questions that adapt to their learning. Didn't quite work. Nothing quite works. So how do I prepare them? Well, that's in my session tomorrow. I'll talk to you about it. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> the piece of what I do is I help them to figure out what is their learning best. What's not necessarily style, but how do they bring in the information? Some say, I can see your PowerPoint and I'm ready. Some say, I need to watch those videos, but how can I make them faster? <laughs> Some say, hey, I can watch those videos, but I need to make them slower. How can I do that? Some say, I like that interactive questioning because it brings back questions I don't understand. Others are like, those questions frustrate me because I didn't understand it. So I work with them to find what works best for their learning before class so when they're there they feel prepared and not lost. And that's what I do to help them get ready. Now we'll have Jen share how she doesn't lecture, instead uses different activities to get the information out. So I second everything that Corey just said. One of the things that I think we have to keep in mind, and we need to trust the student. We really need to trust the student. So teaching in this format can be difficult at the beginning because there's a lot of pre-preparation on our end, right? We're finding those videos. We're finding those links. We're finding those articles. We're doing a lot of research on our end, and we're keeping it current as well. 
So I'm always changing. It's never perfect, right? It's always been, um, every semester it's changed. So by allowing the students to have that choice, everyone loves choice, right? So if I go to um, a place to eat, I'm thinking about today's society, right? You go to Blaze Pizza or that new one on Capital Mod Pizza. It's all about choice, right? Everything's what you want. That's kind of what students today want. They want choice. So if I'm posing a discussion question in a flipped classroom model where they're going to do the work ahead of time, like Corey said, they have a variety of ways to meet that competency that I'm trying to achieve or that learning activity goal by watching that video, by doing the reading. But whatever they do, they're putting it together into that discussion form to help their peers learn. It might be a topic they know a ton about and they don't need to do a ton of that pre-work. It might be something that's brand new to them and then they have to do a lot of that learning ahead of time. When they come into class and we actually apply the knowledge, it's not me saying you didn't do your pre-work, you're not ready. And when I say pre-work, I just mean watching everything and being fully prepared. It's the students in the classroom that are actually putting the pressure on that person who is not quite ready. Uh, it usually just takes one time for that to happen and students come ready to learn. They don't want to feel that way. Melissa. Share your thoughts. Um, so instead of lecturing, uh, you know, I started off that way years and years ago, and death by PowerPoint hits pretty quickly with students. You can see it within about 15 minutes. And so if I ever do PowerPoint, I will do about two or three slides, and then the fourth slide might be a um, question prompts or something like that that gets the students thinking and, um, and kind of breaks that up. I do a lot of um, group uh, activities where this person researches this topic and this person researches this topic, um, and, and then they do the group sharing that way. Um, I do the flipped classroom where I have the students um, do the pre-work, and in our case, the pre-work is doing some online research. So I do IT support, and um, just so you know, IT support people are just better Googlers than you. <clears throat> So I need to teach my students to be really great Googlers. And so a lot of the pre-work that I have them do is research and, um, and you know, documentation about what they're finding online. And of course, I utilize a lot of Canvas to deliver the materials. So I'm leveraging um, all of that to give them, as, as Jen and Corey said, give them all the materials so that they have the things ahead of time that they need. Excellent. So our next question is, what do you wish you knew before conversion? And we're going to start with Brenda Wolf. I um, thought that all students loved doing pre-course work. <laughs> and um, that's not the case. I may be very excited um, two weeks prior to the course and thinking that everyone is waiting with bated breath for either when Blackboard would open up or when Canvas would open up the um, the course that everyone would be right on their pre-course work. And I've learned that that's absolutely not the case and it's actually, I've seen a decline in students getting their um, pre-course work done. So one of the things that I am working with the eight week conversion is to still have some pre-course work that needs to be done before they walk in, but not make it as high stakes as it was before. So if they're, um, it's not as, more, not as difficult to get done, one of the things that frustrates me is if the students don't have their textbooks for the first day of class. So I'm hoping to put um, a small low stakes um, um, assessment, uh, learning activity um, prior to them coming into the first day of class to require them to actually have the textbook. Um, but I'm not having any real substantial, huge assignment due before they walk in on that first day. Thanks. Jen, what do you wish you knew before conversion? Well, I can share that the first year of blended options was kind of a bust. Um, I really just thought we'll take everything we do in 16 weeks, we'll squish it together and we'll just get it done. Um, that didn't really work at all. So what I really had to figure out, and I wish I would have known this ahead of time, was really just how do I decipher the materials that are super important that must be known versus what I think is really cool and I think is important. So by really looking at those course competencies, and I just now, when I talked about that J-Term course, that was one of the first courses I built in Canvas. 
I opened it up this year and I'm like, oh my gosh. So even when you think about the learning that occurs in one year, um, especially with a new learning management system, it's incredible. So just um, looking at those competencies is key and then finding out what's the most important thing to be learning and to be teaching and to be understanding and knowing that the students are fully grasping that material. And there's a million ways to do those activities and what is the best way? And what works for one group of students does not work for the next group of students. And that is something that I think just comes with experience of one group after another, right? And just learning and having all those things kind of tucked in your hat that you can pull out when you know something's not going well. Carrie, what do you wish you knew before conversion? Um, I guess that it's a, a process that never really ends. I mean, every year, we've been doing this for f four years, and every year, you know, I still look at every course and make changes and enhance the online piece as I learn more about Canvas. And just that, um, you know, it's a process that I think, just like we're doing now, I think every year is a process as far as keeping up to date on current materials and things like that. But just that added piece of, um, if you're having that online portion to your class, just keeping that very active and, and um, up to date for students. Um, I just got new contacts and they're really bad and I can't even read what I wrote. So I'm <laughs> totally just talking, I'm talking from the heart here, Brad. Um, I, <laughs> um, but yeah, just keeping current on things. So you're always up to date on it. Well, Carrie, since you're talking from the heart, let's start with you on the next question, which is tell us about how you support struggling students as they engage in a course in an eight-week format. That one I can talk from the heart because that is always an issue in the fall when we start our cohort. Being that they have to come to class with that pre-work done, it's inevitable that I have a handful of students every year that come week after week after week and don't have that work done. And like Jen said, a lot of times some students it corrects for themselves because they feel that peer pressure when they're doing the group work in class. For some it doesn't. So I struggled with how do I get them to do this work? And I know in November's in service, that's a lot of questions at our session was, okay, well they're not gonna do the pre-work. How do you get them to do the pre-work? Um, so one of the things I've done, which has worked out really well this past fall and the fall before I did it, um, was have start with a study group in the fall where I physically met with those groups of students who didn't feel success that first week because they didn't get the work done. So we met. I didn't do much. I just provided a space um, and some time for them to sit and do their pre-work as if they were at home, but now you're with me and you have two hours. It showed them they can get it done. Um, they went to class that day. I did it on the same day of class. You don't have to, but I did it on a Monday afternoon. Then they went right into class. Many of them came up to me and said, oh, that felt so good to come to class prepared. I didn't feel that nervousness, like, oh, my gosh, we're going to do group work, and I don't know what we're talking about. So that one taste of success for them really helped them. So I, I wean them off of that study group. We do it for about three weeks, and then they're on their own to do it. If I have more students in the spring that need it again, we'll start it up. So we'll see when classes start next week if we need to do a couple weeks of it again. But um, for most, that does the trick for them. Melissa, what do you do to, to support the struggling students in the eight-week format? I got my notes on my phone. <laughs> you can read them? Okay. It's real big. <laughs> um, so, so I recently, and it, it really hit this past year um, because I had... I'm really starting to see what it feels like to be under this eight-week calendar. So instead of managing five or six or sometimes seven classes at a time, I found myself managing three to four classes in an eight-week period. And what that allowed me to do was stay connected with student success a whole lot better. And so I found that I needed to identify these students approximately week two or three. So in a 16-week class, you know, weeks three, four, maybe you're starting to see the students that are not keeping up. But I had the energy and I had the time to, um, to really identify them early. And as I did that, I, I, I reached out over the Canvas inbox and poof, 
they responded. Uh, so I had, I had some great conversations that way. Um, and then what I did is I either encouraged them or I um, reached out to the counselors and the student services to help them. So something that I've learned over many, many, many years of teaching is to be very careful with my energy and um, try not to spend 80% of my energy on one or two students. And so I've been able to manage that a little bit better by identifying who those students are and then helping to connect them with the right services um, to make them successful. Thanks. Corey, what do you do to help support the struggling students? I think it, I start out assuming all my students are going to struggle with economics. So I assume they're all struggling uh, to learn, especially this topic. And so I try to. So often I would sit there and say, you missed that test, you missed that assignment, what are you going to do to make up for it? When are you going to get caught up and things like that? When I see an individual student get behind, I'll, I'll ask them, you know, what happened? What came up? How can I help you get on track again? And make it a conversation about getting them engaged again as opposed to them feeling bad that they missed something. The other piece in there too is I allow missed deadlines. I don't take off so much for missed deadlines. It's more about a conversation, how can we get going? How can we get you caught up? And everything can be redone. Now, students can't redo to an A, they can redo to successful completion. So when a student doesn't do well on the first test, they don't have to sit there and go, oh my gosh, my whole grade's ruined, right? I gotta drop, I gotta try this again sometime. No, you can make up for it. You can try again on this, and you can learn how to improve to learn better so that you can be more successful later on. Some of my colleagues made fun of me because I let one of my students take the first test eight times. But she successfully completed it and had the understanding after the eighth time. Why make this student drop out and try again later on? Why not have them try again right now so they can be successful now? And then she was motivated that she can do it. And all the other tests coming up, she did it on the first try, as opposed to the eighth try. Oftentimes, our students, they fail. They fail our course. In the past, they would come back the next semester. They don't do that so much anymore. So to figure out how they can be successful when they haven't done well this semester, especially in the eight-week, is really important. So I spend most of my time on setting up my course for all students, not just the struggling students. Too often, I would say to the student, Check the syllabus, or as it says in the syllabus, how many times have we written emails? Well, as it says in the syllabus on page three, if you just look at it, right? Instead of that, just answer the question and say, here's another place where you can find that information also instead of waiting for me to reply. So the piece is engaging with the students, seeing when something is off, asking if something has come up. I'll say, did something come up in your life? I noticed that in the past week you haven't been able to do some, some of the work that you normally have. Is there a way we can get things going? But once the emails hit the three back and forth in conversation, I say, you know what, we need a conversation either online or in person because that's where the real learning happens is when I see them directly like that. So like Melissa said, having just two or three or four courses at a time to focus on with the students is better than having the six or seven to keep them engaged and that's what I find most important there. Thank you. Great, now we'd like to talk about how to replicate active learning in an online environment. And we'll start with Jen. Over there. I'm sorry, there's a question over there. Just a to what you introduced the retesting multiple times. I understand that you are uh, drawing from a test bank and likely wording questions differently so that the students are not seeing the same questions over and over and over again. Yeah, that's correct, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they might be similar questions, but actually a different question that they're responding to. Yes, correct. And the pool from the pre-test before they, they learn a subject and the post one come to the same pool. So you may actually get a same question or two yeah. and they feel good about that. Oh, good. I got that one, right? Mm -hmm. So um, again, it's to have them motivated to feel like they can, they can learn it is really important here. Mm -hmm. Very good. So again, we'd like to uh, now move our discussion to how to replicate active learning in an online environment. Jen. So when I think about active learning online, um, one of the terms that I found when I was looking up some online fun activities 
was um, it was called engagement architecture. I thought that was kind of a cool term because really it's about making that online class active. So when I teach um, in my cohort, I have a Wednesday night class, four hours, six to 10 p.m. Then the class is over. And pretty much everyone's like, oh, I'm exhausted. I'm going home, going to bed. Then my students um, open up child care centers at 6 a.m. So they're literally going home, falling in bed, and getting back up in the morning. What we need to make sure we're doing when we're teaching online is that that class isn't done. It's not over. It's still active. It's still going. So by keeping that class moving, and I love, love, love the Canvas messaging system and the Canvas app, because when I send out on Thursday morning, I'll send a summary. And it'll be a what did we do last night type of a message. And I'm really just jotting down what we did or anything that came up, some of the key points we talked about, um, giving them a good like have a great week type um, message, stay warm, you know, those silly type things. But that's coming out to them right away that next morning. And then the next module opens. And then it's active throughout that week. And I'm sending an announcement to them. I'm checking in with them. Like Corey said, if I'm noticing a student hasn't done anything, I'm checking in, seeing how they're doing, you know, what's happening. Um, in the online, um, as far as, you know, an active activity in online, one of the things that I love to do, and this is um, something that we can talk about if you want to learn more tomorrow, would be I love to use Flipgrid, which is a video tool for online discussions. So the students are then using, they love their phones, so they're using their phone, they're answering the question via a video with closed captioning, putting that on, um, right, embeds right into Canvas, and then they're able to interact with their classmates. I absolutely love that for keeping it active online. Excellent. Um, I believe Carrie's going to share a little bit about what she does to, to do online active learning. Um, I have to say this is something that I continue to try to research and learn about because I don't feel like I'm an expert in this area at all. Um, although my master's degree is in technology, I don't, you know, everything changes so quickly. You just have to stay up to date. So I, too, love Flipgrid, and, you know, if we talk to our colleagues, we learn about new cool things. Um, I didn't use discussion boards a lot, so I'm including them more in my online portion of my classes. Um, but just staying current on things that are out there for the technology, and there are so many cool things now. And we have, our program is one-to-one. -one. Um, we have iPads in our program, so we can do a lot of really cool things with our students because there's so many nice apps out there to do that. So just being the one to find them and letting the students find them too. We spend time in class where you have to find an app to do this and then share it with your classmates. So um, integrating a lot of that into the online portion keeps it active throughout the week. So we'd like Brenda Wolf to also comment on how to make the online portion uh, Active. Uh, one of the strategies that I have used is um, I have taken um, the entire roster of a course and then broken it down into either pairs or into threesomes or foursomes into small group work. Um, the students have to complete uh, um, an activity or an assignment, um, pro small project in between the weeks. They need to determine how they are going to best collaborate. Um, those groups of two, three, or four, um, they either determine how they're going to collaborate online to get the work done, or many of them actually come to campus and actually see each other face to face to get something done. And then their work product is posted to a discussion board for peer evaluation by the other teams. So you still get that active learning, learning from each other type of um, activity, but it's online outside of the classroom. And then we build on that sort of activity when we get together face to face in the classroom. Excellent, thank you. So um, finally, we want to have a few of our colleagues talk about what is the most useful tool that you've used as you've designed and facilitated alternate delivery modes. And we'll start with Melissa. You're going to be surprised when I tell you it is Canvas. Um, <laughs> and the pieces within Canvas, though, that I really like um, are the rubrics. So spending the time, and I think in November, um, there were some sessions on that. I think um, there's some sessions as well today. If you're not using rubrics, we need to talk. Um, it, 
it's a game changer. It saves so much time in the long run. And I feel that it's a, it's a great way to just communicate with students what you expected and what they did and how that meets in the middle. So rubrics, definitely. Um, and then, uh, oh, I just thought of one more. Oh, shoot. OK. It's gone now, rubrics. Well, we'll talk to a couple of other people. And if you think of the other one, just flag me and we'll come back to you, OK? So Corey, what do you do? What tool? So as I mentioned before, um, and I'll discuss this also at the faculty forum tomorrow if you want to talk more about it, but the biggest challenge I've had is, and, and how to make it work, is having choice for the students in learning. I'm, you've heard us a few times up here. When they know they have a choice of how they can learn the material, that's a game changer. They feel they are in control, that they, they have the ability to have their learning work their way. I spend a lot of time working with students to see which way works best for their learning. I've had students come up to me and say, I spent all these hours studying and I didn't do well on that test. And I'll say, well, then it wasn't efficient. Economics is about efficiency. If you told me you studied five minutes and got a 95 in a test, I'm happy about that. They're like, really? I said, yes. That means you were very efficient at your learning, means you can use your time for other things. That's being efficient. That's being economic about it. And so the 80-20 rule really comes out here. We spend 80% of our time probably with about 20% of our students. And it's to work with them to help them which works best for their learning. Some students will show me all the highlighting they did in the book and all the notes they took and all that kind of stuff. I'll say, that's great, that's wonderful, but was that a really good use of your time? And for some of them, they've never heard that before. That's how they're taught to learn. And I'll say, let's try this. What worked here? And so my students all have to do the first module, all the assignments, and then they reflect upon which assignments worked best for them. Then I let them have a choice moving forward as to which assignments, type of activities they'll do for the learning moving through the rest of the course. And having a conversation about what's working best for their learning has probably been the single most useful tool or strategy I've had for students in learning economics and showing it in the completion and success rates. Excellent. It came back to me. Excellent. Jump in there. <clears throat> um, it's the EB markers. So um, a few years ago in the L building, we made an investment to set up um, their markers that when you write on the board, it um, uh, gathers it up into PDFs and then you can post those into Canvas. And it's been a really awesome tool. I think that Todd Vidal has probably made the most use out of that tool, who can fill the board five times in a classroom. Um, but it, it, it takes away from you having to you know, make a lot of extra notes, um, and students don't have to take pictures of the board. It's automatically there. So that's another really great piece of technology that isn't online, um, but it, uh, it, it kind of serves both purposes. And if you have questions about that, you can ask me or anybody else on um, our team in the L building. Excellent. Brenda Wolf, what's the most useful tool that you found help you to deliver in this alternate mode of delivery? I would um, echo the sentiments about using, utilizing Canvas to its fullest capability. And I'm still working through trying to figure out what are the best things to use and expanding my repertoire of things to use through Canvas. Um, certainly, I have found that um, the discussion boards, making sure that you're um, uploading videos, Corey had eloquently um, indicated that you need to provide a variety of different um, materials for the different types of learners. I have found that to be the case as well. Um, multiple videos, multiple articles, um, obviously supporting the textbook that you have um, in the course. Um, I've also utilized um, uh, videos from the Canvas forum um, with regard to helping students navigate Canvas itself. Some of them just aren't comfortable with discussion boards, aren't comfortable with creating a video. Um, I like when they can upload videos of themselves um, to kind of you know, simulate um, them presenting in class if it's an online format. Um, so get, making sure that they're comfortable and they have the resources available, and if necessary, cover some of those videos in the face-to-face -face portion so that they're comfortable when they're doing the four to five hours worth of work outside of class. Excellent. And we have one more um, offering from Jen. I just wanted to add um, the importance of Red Shelf. I don't know if you use Red Shelf for your textbooks, but that has been amazing for us. 
the students have the textbook on day one or actually a week before whenever your course is opening. And that has been huge. I don't hear anyone say, I don't have money to get the textbook or I can't get to the bookstore. Um, and the Red Shelf online textbooks have been outstanding. So if you haven't looked into that yet, I highly recommend it. Excellent. So that kind of wraps up the questions that we plan to have uh, this group of faculty share their um, insights about. But we strongly suggest that if you have a chance to come to the faculty forum tomorrow morning, that you do so. Um, it, it will run from 8 a.m. to, let's see, about 9. And all these faculty will be there. Uh, we'll have table setups. We can have small group discussions. Um, you'll be able to talk to probably at least three of the faculty throughout the, that session. And uh, it would just be a great way to connect in a more small group fashion to ask your specific questions and to you know, quiz them a little bit more about some of the techniques and strategies they've used. So um, with that, I guess I'm going to transition back to Brad. Thank you. We're going to take a break until 9.15. All right. As I mentioned uh, in the beginning comments, we have the uh, great opportunity to have two Achieve the Dream coaches with us for two days. Uh, one of them is going to spend time with the large group today, and the other one's going to spend time with the large group tomorrow. And they bring with them a lot of expertise in what we're trying to do, a lot of passion behind what we're trying to do. One will be really focused on supporting faculty through this conversion process and, and tomorrow really focusing on how faculty can support students throughout, uh, throughout this process. So what I'm going to do is introduce both of them today, even though you'll hear from one of them today and, and uh, the other one tomorrow. So I'm going to start with Jennifer Hill Kelly. As I mentioned, they both have a lot of street cred. I'm going to start by telling you, Jennifer used to work at NWTC in Green Bay, so Northeast Wisconsin Tech College. So she's out of our system. So Jennifer is a holistic student supports coach at Achieving the Dream. In, in this role, she assists colleges in improving the student experience through the intentional development of scalable, comprehensive student support services. Prior to Achieve the Dream, she serves as, or served as the area manager for the Oneida Nation in education and training, where she provided leadership for the na nation's early intervention, child care, youth enrichment services, higher education, and job training. She also served as a project manager for student success at Northeast Wisconsin Technical College, where she facilitated collaborative cross-divisional teams of faculty and staff in development of an electronic academic planning tool working to improve developmental education and increase alumni engagement. I should mention NWTC is also in the process of transitioning to um, eight-week delivery um, at the same time as us. In addition, she was integral in launching a diversity inclusion training for faculty and staff with an emphasis on expanding the use of data and evaluation for student success interventions. She also is uh, an adjunct faculty member at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. She teaches public and nonprofit program evaluation at the undergraduate level. She holds a Master of Science in Environmental Science and Policy from the University of Wisconsin Green Bay and a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology from the University of Oklahoma. Thank you for joining us and welcome. So Jennifer will be speaking to the groups um, tomorrow. Today, you get to hear from Dr. Lori Flad. Lori is the Director of Holistic Student Supports at Achieving the Dream. In this role, she is responsible for the strategic leadership and implementation of Achieve the Dream's coaching services related to holistic student supports, advising redesign, and transformative institutional change. Her role also involves assisting colleges in improving the student experience through the intentional development of scalable comprehensive support services. Prior to working at Achieve the Dream, she spent her career as a practitioner in the community college serving in science and math as an adjunct instructor, full-time instructor, department head, and associate dean. 
Most recently, she had served at Trident Technical College. You should remember that name. It's one of the ones we've talked about that we've, uh, an institution we've talked to a lot about this transition. And when I talk about street cred, she was right there in it, going through this just like all of us are. So most recently, she had served at Trident Tech College as a director of academic advising and the project director of the IPAS grant. As project director, Lori and her team worked across academic affairs and student services to transform the student onboarding and advising experience. Lori holds a PhD in educational leadership from Clemson. Her dissertation examined distance learning in a community college setting and how student satisfaction varies with interaction. She has a Master of Science in Molecular Biology from Clarkson University and a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology and Immunology, I'm sure some of you understand what all those words mean, from the University of Rochester. Lori, thank you, welcome, and the stage is yours. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Usually that's never a problem. My voice carries, but there are quite a few of you back there. Everybody hear me back there? All right, if you can't at any point, raise your hand and let me know. Okay, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit more. So I think Brad did a great job. I highlight my education only because I want you to know that and my experience is because I've done this as a faculty member. Um, I have been faculty for most of my career. As a matter of fact, I just started at ATD um, 18 months ago. Up until that point, and like Brad, I just turned 50 in May as well. Um, go Gemini. Yeah, that's cool, right? Um, I just turned 50 in May as well. Um, I spent my entire career in community college for the most part. I had a small stint at four year. I've done a little graduate student teaching. Um, but really my heart and my career has been at the community college and I felt like this was really a natural transition when I started working for achieving the dream to take the passion that I had for my students at Trident Tech and to serve all students across the country through achieving the dream. So I am a tireless student advocate but also for most of my career I served as a tireless faculty advocate as well. Um, faculty member department head for physical sciences, um, associate dean for science and math. Um, so through some, through some you know, big changes um, to the academic calendar and then also to our advising structure and all of our faculty were, we were completely faculty uh, driven for advising. So we put a lot of change on our faculty in a, in a relatively short amount of time. So I wanted to make sure that I shared that with you. Um, I'm from, so everybody, I heard the little groan in the audience when Brett mentioned that I did my PhD at Clemson. Yes, I'm a little sad this morning, um, but I will be fine. We had a good run. It was a good, it was a good season. Um, but I grew up in upstate New York, um, Albany, New York. I went to college in Rochester, um, did my undergrad. I've spent the last 20 years, though, and I'm based out of Charleston, South Carolina. So you may hear me get my all y'alls and my use guys mixed up a little bit. Sometimes that happens, just bear with me, that's why. I have pretty much spent equal amounts of my life now in both of those places. Um, we are getting close in Charleston for me to be spending more time there than I actually spent in my hometown. Um, but, I ha but I am based on, even though Achieving the Dream is based out of just outside of DC, I actually am a remote employee, I travel so much to colleges across the country. There's really no point in me having an office there. Um, my office, we, we joke and say that we have a Charleston office at Achieving the Dream. That's my house. Um, <laughs> and also we, we've managed to move one more person down to Charleston. So now we have two people um, in Charleston at the Charleston office. Um, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit um, about that. Uh, I, I wanna thank the faculty panel um, because Honestly, Jennifer and I were listening and we're like, this is great, you know, you guys could just keep going and we'll just stay here and we'll, you know, throw some questions at you. But great, great information. It's great work that's going on here. You know, some of the things that I heard are true across the board. I don't, I don't really care where you're doing this work. You know, this is not a perfect, it's, first of all, it is a process. You usually don't get it perfect the first time, but you don't have to. Right, so we're gonna talk about a lot of this this morning. Um, I'm actually gonna wear two hats this morning while I talk to you. Um, 
but I wanted to make sure that I uh, told you, let me see if I can get my, here we go, um, my notes ready here, that I have done this work from a faculty perspective and then also helped faculty do it from an administrative perspective. So had large groups of faculty, heard the frustrations, the complaints, um, you know, my students are different, my program is different. I've, I've, I've worked with that um, and we have actually, it's possible. And actually when you come out on the other side, it looks pretty good, right? So let's talk about our time together today. So our time together today will be all sunshines, rainbows, and unicorns. No, I just love the picture of that cat. Um, so our time today, um, I hope that you leave here invigorated after, after we're done together um, this morning. And I hope that you say good things so people come back for the afternoon session. Um, but I wanted to let you guys know um, that I recognize that this is hard work, that this requires a lot of learning, it is tiring work, sometimes it's frustrating work, um, but it is also very rewarding. And I think we heard some of that on the faculty panel this morning. Um, you're gonna hear, so I will share with you some of the good, a lot of the good, a little bit of the, you know, the challenges that we had at Trident. I'm going to try to be as honest and real as I can with you this morning about our experience at Trident. I also have, um, based on working with colleges in the network, um, I have some, also some information from Amarillo College. So they, ch they went to Amarillo Colleges in Texas and they went to um, eight week sessions, I think about the same time that we did, if not a little bit later. Um, so we started in fall of 2014. I think Amarillo went a little bit later. Um, so I have a little bit of information um, based on their experience as well. I sat with um, one of their student directors and talked to her recently about what that, what that change looked like for them. So, but what I want to ask you guys to do, you know, we have a long time together this morning. I do have some activities peppered in here. I'm going to ask you, this is an interactive session, right? I'm not here to just lecture you on what this looks like at Trident. This is supposed to be helpful to you. So if I say something and you have a question about it, please put your hand in the air and I'm gonna ask everybody to sort of keep an eye out because sometimes I get on a roll and I don't see the hands in the air. Um, so ask questions. I may not have all the answers. I do have some data. I will show you data towards the end of the presentation as well. Um, but please ask questions. I don't want you to leave here with a question about Trident or about achieving the dream because you didn't ask it wasn't something that I covered because I'm not going to be able to cover everything before 1130 um, but I want to make sure that I cover the things that are important to you and I and I'm hoping that I I've included some of that in this but if I have not and there's something missing I would really love for you to let me know what that is deal okay but take it easy. I remember I'm still fragile from yesterday. No, just kidding. I'm fine. I'm just kidding. I'm fine. Okay. So I thought I would start um, with our network. So I'll put my ATD hat on first before I put on my faculty hat, although I feel like I always wear my faculty hat, but I'm going to switch over to my ATD hat for right now. So I'll tell you a little bit about, if you're not already familiar with it, I'll tell you a little bit about our network. So Achieving the Dream leads a growing network of community colleges across the country. We have over 220 colleges in our network across the country. I think we're up now to like 44 states instead of 40 states is, is a little bit old. And our collective impact reaches over 4 million students. Um, and we are, and it's over, we have over 60 coaches and we're actually doing a little bit of work in some other countries, South Africa and New Zealand, we're working with them a little bit as well. So, um, and we work, you know, our goal is to, and our philosophy is to, I'm making sure I'm pushing the right buttons here. Um, it's built on a theory of change that revolves around coaching, innovation, and connection. And that's the value of our network. And we have four core principles. We believe in the power of fundamentals for colleges. If you join the network, even if you don't join the network, we believe in there's seven really core capacities for colleges to work towards that prepare them for transformative change. And the type of work that you are doing here is transformative change. A conversion to Canvas, compression of an academic calendar, that is transformative change for sure. And you are all very active participants in that. So 
Um, we also believe in advancement through relationships. Again, that's why we have such a big network of colleges. We encourage colleges, and I know that you guys do this very well in the system, to work together um, as you work through these problems to get some best practices, lessons learned. Um, and then we work um, on an ecosystem of reform, but then also uh, at our center is equity. So that is our philosophy and what we are, what we are all about in achieving the dream. Um, how many of you are familiar with achieving the dream a little bit? Okay, not too bad, not too bad. All right, so I thought I would start, so I'm gonna ask you guys to help me first. Everybody has their cell phone? Good, I'm gonna ask you to pull it out. Keep pushing the wrong button, Jennifer. Okay, uh, so first of all, I wanna make something clear. I am not gonna share this information with a big group. So this is not something I'm gonna present as a group. But I wanted to sort of get the pulse of the room and see what were some of your biggest concerns about this move to a compressed format, compressed academic calendar. So there's two ways that you can do this. You can either go, you can text in all caps, Julia Law, I know Julia Lawton's not even here. Bear with me, it's her account. She knows we're using it, by the way. Julia Lawton 447 to the number 22333. Once you join, you can answer this question. Okay? Or you can visit their website and also answer it that way. So if you don't want to text, you can also visit Poll Everywhere's website with, at the address at the bottom. Okay. So I'm going to give you guys about five minutes. So you can put in as many concerns as you have. Again, I am not going to show this to anybody. <clears throat> Jennifer's going to sort well, I, okay, that's a little bit of a lie. Jennifer's going to see it, okay? So Jennifer's going to see it. And so I, what I hope to do is make sure as I'm talking, I address a lot of the concerns that you have. I want to make sure this works and is beneficial for you, okay? How's it going? Is it working? I know it's working because I tested it. It is working? Okay. So I'm going to give you guys just a couple minutes to do that. Again, you can put in as many concerns as you have. There's no limit on, I don't think there's any limit on the, um, on the number of responses. Okay. So as you guys, you feel free to continue. So that will stay open. So if something else pops into your head and you want to add it to the list, feel free. That will, that is active. That poll is active and will remain active for our entire time here this morning. So if something else pops up and you want to add it to the list, by all means do that. I will share just in full transparency. So as we went to make the um, conversion to seven weeks at Trident, so we went from um, 15 weeks to two seven-week sessions with a week in between. So we were seven on, week off, seven on, and that was our 15 weeks. Um, and so I taught microbiology at the time. Um, also taught a little bit of A and P, but primarily I was teaching microbiology at the time. It was a 200 level microbiology for students. And so I was most concerned about how I was going to cram that very content heavy course into eight weeks of time. And so I kept, you know, uh, and, and like I said, I'll give you the Trident story in a little bit, but, you know, I, I did hear a lot from our, um, you know, as we were working with administrators, um, which, of course, I was one of the administrators as well, so it was a little weird, but um, that it's the same amount of time, right? It's the same minutes in eight weeks as it is in 16 or 15 minutes, or 15 weeks, not 15 minutes, that's really fast, um, in 15 weeks. But for me, it didn't feel like the same minutes, right? Quantitatively, it felt like the same minutes, Right? I mean, if we did the math, it was the same number of minutes. But I was worried about how do I engage students for so long in a week. I was worried about that. I was worried about my class wasn't terribly active as far as active learning. It was primarily a, a lecture course. You know, we were getting students ready for the nursing program. You know, we were lecturing them to death. I'm not going to lie. We were lecturing them to death. Um, and I didn't really, I wasn't up necessarily on all the active learning strategies that might be helpful. So I knew it was going to be a steep learning curve for me. So, so far, the things that I've shared for you that were concerns were all mine, right? 
How am I going to fit this content into eight weeks? How am I going to engage the students longer? How am I going to create active learning? And so we really, I, I had to put the student at the center a little bit more. And when I started to think about it from the student experience, then I started to get even more worried. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, how are we going, are they going to be okay if we do this to them? I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. The answer is yes, they were just fine. They were actually better than me. Um, they did just fine with the change. Um, actually, once, you know, the, the, and the students that are going to struggle the most with this are probably your current students, right? Students that are accustomed to a longer term, and then you change to a shorter term. That's probably going to be the biggest pain point with students, that change. So when Jennifer, tomorrow, when she talks about how you support students, that, that is a population to pay attention to. How do you support students that are used to a more, now I know you guys do have shorter summers, and you do have other, so there are students who are already familiar with this, right? Um, how do you leverage the, what you have, the students that have the familiarity, to help the students that may not be as familiar? How can you provide in and out of class supports for students that might not be um, as ready for that, especially if they're accustomed to a longer term? So, and, and like I said, we'll talk more about Tritum, but that was probably the student group that struggled um, with this the most. Okay, so like I said, that is open and you can continue to um, add concerns to that over the course of our time together. So I'm going to keep my ATD hat on and talk a little bit about transformative change. Um, and that is something that we deal with closely with colleges across the country. Most of the time when we are engaging with colleges across the network, they are making large changes, large transformative changes to their institution, very similar to the ones that you have undertaken in the last year and a half, okay? So transformative change, I can't, so I have new contacts as well. I can't see, so they, being 50, they tried to split the difference. I don't know anything about, you know, contacts and eyeglasses. So what they've done is I have these multifocal lenses. So now I can't see anything close and I can't see anything far away. <laughs> so I pretty much can't see at all. So I'm going to ask you guys <laughs> to bear with me <laughs> because <laughs> it's a struggle. All right, so I'm going to move back here where I can see the big screen. So transformative change is a pro so I found this on the internet actually there's all kinds of definitions for what transformative change is but it's a process of profound radical change that orients an organization in a new direction it changes profoundly the way that you do things and we transform our institutions for a number of reasons right we transform our institutions for things like to Im improve persistence and retention we transform our institutions to increase completion. At Trident, our driving reason for moving to compression was success, student success. Students were not as successful in their courses as we wanted them to be, and it was, it was falling fast and not showing any sign of getting better. And a lot of times, I call it the tail that wags the dog, in a lot of the instances, Things like performance-based funding. We make big changes to our institutions to make sure we are well positioned when large changes statewide or even you know, federal-based changes to position us well to keep us, in, keep us funded, right? You have to fund the mission. So that's an important piece. And then also accreditation is another reason why we make big changes to our institutions, why we undergo transformative change. And there are a number of, of ways to tackle this type of change. There's an, I mean, if you want to find a book on Amazon as well as a heart for your next talk, um, there are a lot of books on Amazon on, how to, on transformative change and how to change an institution. You know, we are familiar with, there's, um, has anybody heard of Cotter, John Cotter and his um, theory of transformative change? He uses penguins, actually. It's actually quite a quite a funny little uh, way that he shares the journey of transformative change. It's called Our Iceberg is Melting. Um, it's actually a really good little tale of how a group of penguins save themselves from, you know, their iceberg melting using transformative change or transformational change. Um, there's also, anybody ever heard of the Heath Brothers? 
Chip and what's Dan, yes, thank you, Chip and Dan Heath. They're another, they have a much more slimmed down version of transformative change. Um, but there's a lot, and I'm not here to, you know, promote one or the other, or even really to give you any of the details. Um, but it's worth mentioning that this work results in transformative change at your institution. Absolutely. And some of the characteristics of transformative change, I thought, you saw, there's a lot of them, but I picked four that I thought were particularly applicable to the type of change that you are going through right now. And that is, it includes, or it implies radical change in how members think, perceive, and behave. And when, I, and when this says members, I think that includes faculty, staff, but also students, right? This is going to have a dramatic effect on pretty much everybody at your institution on how you think, perceive, and behave. So I thought that was hopefully pertinent to the work that you're doing. Fundamentally alters organizational assumptions. We're going to talk a little bit about systems thinking in a minute and sort of the need for a 10th week. Um, and it's kind of an interesting story that I had with Amarillo. Um, and also some characteristics of transformative change involve systemic change that involves significant learning. This one spoke to me as a when I think back as, as a faculty member trying to make the change, I felt like I had a lot to learn. There was a lot I did not know how to do from making the best use of my adaptive courseware platform, making the best use of my LMS, and how could I get the absolute most out of it so it could be a tool to do some of the heavy lifting for me, but then also engage my students maybe in the time that I was not with them so they were still gaining momentum in the course and getting closer to completing the course successfully. I didn't have all that knowledge. Um, and so, and then how to be more interactive in my classroom as well, right? So how to Im include more interactive or active learning um, activities for my students. So, you know, I think a lot of, you know, I do a lot of talks um, from ATD uh, for faculty. And I'm not going to lie, um, you know, faculty sometimes are s seen as barriers to change. Is that a surprise to anybody in the room? Anybody? Right? Sometimes faculty aren't engaged in change or brought to the table for that reason, because they're worried that they're going to be a barrier to change. And I think as I've done this work over the years and as I've visited faculty across campus, it's not resistance for the sake of res I mean, there's always one or two of those, right? But for the most part, it's I want to know what to do best for my students. And I'm just not sure. So for now, I'm going to keep things the way they are. So we are not used to not being the experts in the room, right? So how can we make sure that we support faculty so they have all the tools that they need? Again, you don't have to get them all at once. You don't have to get them all before you can start change, right? You don't have to be an expert in adaptive learning or adaptive courseware to start using it a little bit. So if I can leave you with, so that's one of the takeaways that I hope that you leave with today is you don't have to be an expert in any of these things to start using it with your students a little bit. And it sounds like you have some, um, some colleagues that have actually had some experience and probably can lend you some help a little bit. So I just wanted, so that's one of the takeaways that I want to leave you with today. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, to those last two bullets, the systemic change, and talk about, can everybody see this okay from where you are? Um, again, I'm going to have to move closer because, you know, can't see near or far. But I wanted to talk about systems thinking. When I was a faculty member, I did not think of my class in the big system of the institution or the college. I thought of my class as my class. You know, I was really sort of self-absorbed in my classroom and my students and my content. You know, I maybe had my department and my division, but, you know, I didn't really think of my class as part of a larger system at the institution. And so the work that you're doing is part of, it, it extends far beyond your classroom. And it's part of a much larger uh, body of work at this institution. So that's the other thing I'm going to ask you to do today is 
sort of think outside of the classroom and how this work contributes to the overall well-being of your students, but also their experience at your entire institution. Because systems work is about um, looking at the parts and pieces of a system and how they interact. And they do interact, even if we don't acknowledge that they interact because we spend most of our time in our classroom, they do interact. So this systems thinking iceberg, this is actually kind of a good um, way to frame systems change. So at the tip of the iceberg, you know, iceberg, when you think about an iceberg, you can see a little bit at the top, but most of the danger, right, lies below the surface. So there's a lot when we think about systems work that is below the surface that we often don't dig deep enough to think about. So what we usually respond to with students or with colleagues are, is at the top, these events at the top. These are what we call symptoms of a deeper problem. So for example, let's use Trident as an example. The symptoms that we were seeing were that students were not being as successful in courses that we want, as we wanted them to be. Our success rates were dropping every single year from 1991 until 2012 or 2011 when somebody finally said, this is madness, how long are we going to let this go on? I mean, they were up and down a little bit. For the most part, it looked like this, though. Okay? So that was what we were seeing. Those are the events that we were responding to. But if you look deeper below the surface, so just below the surface, you see there are patterns of behavior. So as we dug a little deeper into the problem, and if you understand the patterns, then you can start to anticipate what's going to happen. So we noticed that students weren't doing well in 14-week courses, but we also noticed a pattern that students in shorter terms made better grades across the board. We had a three-week May master. We had four-week summer sessions. We were also not strangers to compressed format, although you would think when we rolled it out, nobody had ever heard of it before. And then we had, a, we had an eight- or a nine-week summer session. So we also had compressed formats that we were using at our institution. Students across the board, all categories, did better in compressed format in shorter-term courses. And again, I have the data. I will show you what that looks like in a little while. So that was one. So we could predict and anticipate that students who took our class in May semester were probably going to do better than somebody who took one in 14 weeks. Somebody that took a summer one in four weeks was probably going to do better than somebody that took it in a longer term. So we could predict it by digging a little deeper, we were able to make that association with the patterns. If you dig deeper, you can start to examine and look for structural um, or process, underlying structures or process that are causing these change or causing the things that you see. So our semester structure was causing the events that we were seeing. Having a primarily 14-week, 15-week semester was the structure that was causing the low success rates that we were seeing. One, now, was one of the causes. I'm going to say, and I'll say this again multiple times throughout this talk, this is not going to make, take you from poor success to great success and nothing else matters, right? There are lots of other things that swirl around a student that could have an effect, and we'll talk more about that. But we knew that that 15-week semester was part of the structural problem for our success rates. Students in longer terms were not doing as well. That 15-week semester was a structural concern. And it was something that we had the ability to change. So if you understand what the structures and processes are that are causing a problem, if you dig deep enough, you can design solutions or approaches that might make it better. I'm not saying it's going to make it 100% better, but it might make it a little better. Okay, it might cause some improvement. And then the mental model, and I, so your mental model is really how you think about things, right? And how we think about, at Trident, how we thought about the semester as an organization across the board, not just faculty, although faculty were, you know, big, a big play, uh, big players, 
but even on the student services side of the house and how we delivered services to students. That semester, 15 week semester mentality, also contributed to the events that we were seeing at our institution. They were contributing to the low success rates that we were seeing, how we thought about the semester and we had to change, and that's the hardest part. Changing how you think about things is the hardest part. So we, we looked at, um, at Trident. That's an example of how taking something like poor course success and digging deeper to find the root causes that might be contributing to the symptoms or the events that you're seeing. And that's in, a, across um, the country as colleges are making change. And, and colleges make the changes to eight weeks for different reasons. So Amarillo is another good example. I was sitting with Kara Crowley from Amarillo. She's one of their directors um, at Amarillo. And she said they, their event that they were seeing over and over again was poor retention. Students just were not staying. They, kept, they were not, they were not um, being retained and they were not completing. And when they dug into the data, they saw that the patterns that they were seeing as students were dropping out at week 10. For the most part, that was their loss point. So student journey has points where we can propel them and create momentum. And there's also points that if we're not careful in how we design the student experience, we can lose them. And at Amarillo, week 10 was a loss point for them. So that structure was not working for them. So she said, I said, well, so what do you do? She said, we got rid of week 10. They stopped at eight. They got rid of week 10. And so for them, it was driven by events that they saw related to persistence and retention. And their structure was also the, the semester, but that 10 week, that 10 week point was devastating for student progression. It was serving as a major loss point for students on their journey. And they also had to think about how they, um, how they approach their semester. And you know, that mental model around, and I'm just gonna say for me as a faculty member, I live my entire life by a semester calendar, right? I mean, and I, I see you laughing, smiling and nodding your head because you know if you teach, I taught a long, long time. I would, that semester calendar was ingrained, right? The August, or, you know, early fall start, and then the holidays, and then the winter. When I lived up where they had winter, we don't have, really have real winter where I live now. But as Jennifer keeps reminding me, when I tell her that I'm cold, she's like, this isn't cold, it's 30, it's beautiful. I'm like, okay, if you say so. Um, but so, so thinking about, you know, how we, how we experience time as well, that academic calendar is really ingrained into our mental model. And changing how we think about that is not, I, I don't want to make light of that because that is a major way you're going to have to change your thinking about how you offer um, and how you think about time, academic time. Any questions about this? Yes. I have a question. You, you mentioned something about when you were experiencing going from the full semester to a half, that you still had as much case time with your students. Um, is, did I hear you correctly on Classroom minutes were the same. So classroom minutes, whether you chose to spend them face to face with the student or you chose to engage them on a virtual platform, but the amount of time, time was the same, those classroom minutes. Does that help? Okay. That's a great question. Anything else? Does this make sense? I think sometimes, you know, it's really important for us at colleges to think about who our students are, what they need, and then, you know, a lot of times we hear, well, if students would only do this, and if students would only do that, and if students would only, sometimes we have to flip the lens and look at how we work around our students. Are we designed to serve the students that come to us? Many times we are not. So that's a really important question as you redesign in and out of the classroom. Are you serving the students? Are you serving your students? 
not some generic like community college data generic student. Are you serving the students that come on this campus or your campuses? Those specific students, what are their needs? Is it high poverty? Is there um, you know, structural racism? What kinds of things are holding them back and how are you designing how you work to make them more successful? So that's important. So that's what this is all about, okay? So any other questions before I move on? I've got a little quiz for you. No, it's not really a quiz. It's a little quiz. Anybody know what this could mean? Anybody have an idea? Who says yes? Anybody know? 908. It's not a division problem, by the way. Yeah, no, it's not a division problem. <laughs> it's, it's still too early for that, right? It's only 10 o'clock. We're not doing division yet. That comes later, though. No, it doesn't. Um, okay, so 908. You want to take a guess? Not eight week. That's close, though. You're on the right track. Nicole knows? You have a guess? Mm-hmm. That's right. Nicole gets a gold star. So <laughs> the number of hours that students spend in two years, eight semesters, in front of a faculty member, as opposed to how much time they spend in front of an advisor. And I was generous with the advisor hours. That's assuming an hour per semester with an advisor. Most colleges I visit, that is not the case. Nine, so, and that assumed 15 hours a semester for eight semesters. No three hour classes, no lab courses. I didn't even throw that in, right? That just makes it higher. That just, so this is just assuming three hour classes, 15 credits per semester over eight semesters. There is no way you can do this work, this student, not just eight week work. Obviously we need faculty to do eight week work, eight week compression work. You can't do student experience transformational work on campus without faculty at the table. And I was so excited to hear Corey on the panel talk about some of the ways that he interacts with students in his class when they come in and they're, they've missed an assignment or they're not doing well, and he has that conversation with them. You know, what is, and, and sometimes you don't even have to ask, right? I mean, I always said the 10 minutes before class and the 10 minutes after is where you really find out the things that have nothing to do with your content that are impacting the student's life. Do you guys find that's the same as well? Maybe not 10 minutes, maybe it's five, I don't know what it is, but they will tell you what is going on. And I know tomorrow, Jennifer's gonna spend a lot of time talking about how you can um, support students in sort of that, it's not an other, I don't wanna other that, that role, but in that non-academic role, right? That sort of out of classroom, even though it's really in the classroom. I don't like the term non-academic, because I don't care if it's, I don't understand my algebra or my car broke down, it all affects what goes on in the classroom, right? So it all feels like academic to me. But there are academic concerns and then there are personal need concerns. All of it impacts the classroom. Mm -hmm. So this, this work and how you interact with students um, is really, really, and I think one of the, I don't wanna say side effects, but one of the side bonuses of transforming your course in this way and spending time with students in a different format, I actually felt like I knew my students a lot better. Um, it was fast and it was wild and it was, you know, we covered a lot of material, but I felt like I knew them really well because I saw them every day. We had, you know, we used, we did some creative scheduling at Trident. So I would primarily see my students every day. And if I didn't, I would spend a lot of time with them in lab. So I felt like I knew them better. It's really important for faculty to be involved with students. You are often the very first people or persons that sees a problem with a student. Either they're not coming to class, they were doing really well and suddenly they're not, they're not looking so great, right? I mean, you, I've, we've seen it all. And it's time, 
It's that you are usually the first folks to see that. They're probably their advisor, unless it just happens to coincide with an appointment time, they may not see that. They don't spend as much time with students as you do. And in, in programs where you have cohorts or small programs and few instructors, you know your students really well, right? You guys are probably really familiar with your students and the things that go on with them in and out of the classroom. Okay. Good job, Nicole. I, I really did not bring a gold star with me, but I would have. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, yes, I'll get some. Okay. So we're going to do a little activity. If you guys want to get up and stretch, that's totally cool as well. I know it's a long time to sit down. But wait, first let me tell you what you're going to do, and then I'll turn you loose, okay? So we are going to do a little exercise for you to explore your mental models about teaching. So the phrase, so this is just a, a basic definition. A mental model is an overarching term for any sort of concept, framework, or worldview that you carry in your mind. It's how you think about something. And that impacts what that something is. How you think about it impacts what it is. So I've put some terms up there that could possibly be part of your perspective or worldview on teaching, on your role at teaching here at WCTC. Now, that's not at all inclusive of all terms that could be there. So if you have some that I have not included, by all means, throw them in your mental model. It's your mental model. Don't use my terms. Use your terms. I just threw some up there so you had a starting point. Okay? So I want you to spend about five to seven minutes thinking individually about your view on teaching, your role at, on teaching at WCTC. So just, you, you don't have to share it with anybody at first, just spend, and I don't, I hope, does everybody have some paper or something to record this? Okay. And then after about five or seven minutes, I want you to talk amongst yourselves at your table. And we'll probably take, it probably will take a little longer than seven minutes, and that's totally fine. Um, but I want you to share your view with your table. And don't be shy. I, I, I don't take you guys for a shy crowd. So don't be shy. But talk about your view and where you think it comes from. Why do you think about teaching in this way? Is it because that's how you were taught? Is it because it's how you were educated? You know, so why do you think about teaching in that way? How does it impact, how does your worldview about your role teaching impact your students? And then how does it impact your institution? So we're going to go deep for a couple minutes. So let's say we will get back together at about 1030. Does that sound OK? And um, we'll see if anybody wants to share out. If not, that's fine too. All right, ready, set, go. Okay. Can everybody in the back hear me? All right. So my boss, when I travel with her, she can sing beautifully. So she'll like sing a song and everybody just stops what they're doing and listens to her. And that's how she brings people back. If I was to do that, you would run screaming from the room. So I'm not going to do that. Um, but that's one of the ways that she brings people back. So does anybody want to just shout out, raise your hand, share some of the terms, phrases that came up as you explored your mental models around your faculty role? Curator. Interesting. I like that. Entertainer. Entertainer. Good. Can you sing? <laughs> Storyteller. Good. Anybody else? Yoda? <laughs> Yoda. Baby Yoda or full grown Yoda? <laughs> Maybe a little tangent going on there. What else? I heard another one. Advocate. Advocate. Yes. Great. That's one that doesn't always pop up when we talk to faculty. Thermostat. Oh, nice. This is a very creative crowd. I like it. You didn't use any of my terms. I love it. I'm going to add some of these to my terms, though, because this is really helpful. Change agent. In or out, or both? Both. Good. 
I like it. Anything else? Have I heard from? Mediator. Good. Between? Uh-huh. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I see a lot of head nodding for that one. Is everybody feeling that one? <laughs> feeling mediator? A motivator. Good. Cheerleader. That's one that I've heard a lot, right? Two more. The bridge. The bridge. Between what? Nice. Great. So between their new career and their professional role. Counselor. Counselor. Yes. How many feel that one? Perhaps. A l <laughs> yeah. The advisors are like, woo, that's us. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So thank you for that. I, so what I hoped to get out of that is for you to just start thinking about how you think about your role. It sounds like you all have very well-rounded um, views of mental models of your teaching roles here on campus. Um, think about how that impacts your students and also how that is going to carry over into how it impacts the system as a whole. And then how can you leverage your role to be the most help to both your students and your institution as they're also trying to help students, right? This is a, isn't an us versus them. This is a how can we do this together. So I'm not, you know, Baby Yoda over there, I'm not really sure about, but that's okay. We're going with it. Baby Yoda is very popular, so, and absolutely adorable, so. Okay. So I understand that some of Trident's information has been shared with you, so um, I'm going to share a little bit more. So Trident is located in North Charleston, South Carolina. So we are about mm, 20 miles from the beach. It's a big competitor on some really nice Fridays in summertime. Um, we serve three counties. We have four campuses and four sites. So the fall 2019 headcount was about 12,000. We have a, about if that program number. It's still on their website, but I think it's actually a little smaller. I think they were, they're going to Guided Pathways, so I think they were starting to look at their programs and perhaps pare down some of their programs and be a little more streamlined. But as of their website, they have 150 programs in 10 divisions. We used to have 12 that um, when we went to Guided Pathways that um, was streamlined to 10 divisions. Um, they were a little more intentional about that. And we reflect our community demographically. So it's a very good representative of the community that we serve. Um, one other note that I took um, when the faculty panel was talking, and you were talking a little bit about Guided Pathways, um, and Brad mentioned it as well. This work fits, this eight-week work fits beautifully into the Guided Pathways framework, right? This is how you get students on the path and keep them on the path to completion, right? It falls into almost, except for me, well, it really does fall into all the pillars, but especially two, three, and four. So this is, this all aligns, all of this work, this is not separate classroom work. This is not just faculty work, right? This is aligned work across your institution. So I just wanted to throw that out there as well. OK, so just a little bit. This I didn't have the current fall 2019 numbers for program breakdown. We have a really healthy transfer population. So that makes us a little bit different. We have um, our associate in arts, our AA and our AS, where it says science only. Those are our transfer students, OK? So students can take one of two associate degrees if they plan to transfer. If they plan to transfer into the humanities, they end up in the associate in arts. If they want to transfer into a science program, then would they take the AAS science only. Now, our, our HSP and NUP, you might wonder what those are. Those are our, our holding places for our pre-nursing, pre-allied health. We can't have pre-programs anymore, right? They have to be in a program. So those are um, pre-programs. That's where we put students that are pre-nursing, pre-allied health, while they complete their prerequisites. Some move into their allied health or nursing program, depending on their success in their prerequisite courses. Some decide that's not for them, and they remain in the transfer programs, and then they transfer out to different programs. 
Um, and then our AAS is very large as well, a little bit larger. So our, our transfer population is slightly smaller than our um, applied science. Um, but we have, we're very strong technical college as well. We are both a community college and a technical college as well. So let's talk a little bit about the decision to compress. So at Trident, in 1991, so we're going way in the way back time machine now. Um, in 1991, Trident switched from quarters to semesters. And the success rate never recovered. So that put the kibosh on success rates for us at Trident. Student success data dropped every semester. We started at 76.6%. Success is course grades of A, B, or C, just so you know. That's how we define course success. Um, and it dropped to 62.2 in 2012, and it was showing no signs of recovery. So it looked, let me see where that slide is. I want to show you. It looked like that. There were a few little pockets of sunshine there, but for the most part, it was just a really sad downward trend. So that was one of the, that was the big driver for us. Administra administration looked at the success. It actually, the whole journey started out as a weird IR question about July 4th, having July 4th week off. It's a long story. You don't need to know it. But it ended up, they didn't purposely start looking at Maymester in shorter terms, they just happened to look at it and notice that Maymester, our four-week summer sessions, and our summer term, which was eight weeks, were all um, highly successful compared to our 15-week semester. So um, that was one of the big clues that also um, contributed to the decision to compress. We did have, so like I said, we had some compressed formats, and nursing on our campus had, so we went full across the board in 2014, um, eight-week session. Nursing a couple years prior had actually already gone to eight weeks. So they were our trendsetters um, for programs across the board. We also saw that across all types of disaggregated data, students were doing better in shorter terms. It didn't matter who the student was. If they took a class in a shorter term, they did better. And so this was the compelling decision. If you are looking at data as an institution whose job is to help students reach their goals, and you see something that helps students reach their goals, how can you not act on that? So that was the driving force for Trident to compress. That's where our success rates look like. So this was our um, data. This was the duration of course versus success of students. So we had, this is by age group. So under 25 is sort of, these are not very good colors. They look exactly the same when they're up across the room. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't make these slides. So the first bar is under 25, and the second bar in each group is 25 and over. And the, um, as you go from left to right, the terms get longer. So students do better in terms that are shorter. By race and ethnicity, you will, you will notice, so students do better in shorter terms. Um, here, the shorter terms are on the left, just like the last slide, and the full terms are on the right. You will notice that we still have, Trident still has significant achievement gaps. And that is something that they need to focus on, right? So when I said earlier that there are lots of other, you know, this is one choice to make in improving the student experience at your institution. There are others that matter as well. And there are things that Trident is not looking at that they need to look at to narrow their achievement gaps. So um, this is not going to, so as I said earlier, and I said I would repeat, it's not going to cure everything that ails you, but it does make students more successful. All right. So I was asked to talk about sort of how this was rolled out to faculty. I'm going to give you the short version. It wasn't necessarily the prettiest. Um, how the rollout went. But it was, uh, it was essentially a top-down decision. We heard some rumbling in the faculty, like department heads and deans, and, and the, <laughs> you know, we were blissfully ignorant. We were like, oh, it's not going to happen. That's never going to happen. They're never going to do that, right? That's not going to, never going to happen. So when it did, when the, when the information came out that this was going to be across the, and, and it, we actually found out, um, in the newspaper before we found out as a group. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. So that was, so there was that. Um, not at all intentional. That was not intentional. Okay. But that was a thing, right? You can imagine. Um, the why was not shared early enough to faculty. Once we saw those graphs and started thinking about our courses with our students at the center, we knew our students weren't doing well. Y'all, I was over the math department. We knew our students were not doing well. We knew we had success rates in courses that were less than 20%. One in five students were making it out. We knew we weren't being successful. So this was not a surprise. The why was not shared early enough. To take a collective look and put the student at the center um, but if, so, you know, when you talk about transformative change, communication is probably the most important thing to your stakeholders, to your students. Um, I actually had two perspectives on this change because I was, I was wearing two hats at the time. I was wearing a faculty hat teaching microbiology. And I was also um, department, I may have actually been in my very first year of associate dean. I was either the department head for physical science or I was the, um, the associate dean for science and math. So I had to, from the administrative perspective, looking at how to motivate and sort of try to get this across the board. Because we, fall 2014, it was, we we're flipping the switch. And this was 2012, I think. So we had about a year and a half to get ready for this. So from my faculty perspective, I'm not going to lie, I was a little annoyed. Um, primarily, the rollout was, was tough. Um, and I didn't fully comprehend the why yet. From the administrative perspective, you know, I, now when I think back on how you roll out a change like this, I don't know that you would ever get 100%. Let's do this. It's the best thing that we can do. I, I just don't know that you would ever get that. They still don't have that. Y'all, they've been at this since 2014. They still don't have that. I mean, for the most part, it's going very well, but there are still pockets of resistance that just won't let it go five years later, right? So I think from an administrative perspective, the decision to make the change and do it in a manner that was across the board and swift, understanding from logistics, financial aid. I mean, I didn't understand the complications in the refund schedule for financial aid. There were a lot of other, so when we talk about this being system work, there are a lot of other moving parts. So how does all of this have to work together to make it, because really, it needs to be seamless for the student. But I'm not going to lie, the result looks something like this, right? That's sort of what the reaction was initially when we found out that we were going to, you can't see this, so I will read this to you. Um, and it's interesting because as we were looking through some of the concerns that you posted on our little poll everywhere, a lot of them are the same, right? A lot of concerns with this type of change are the same. Students can't absorb so much content in shorter terms. There was a lot of concern about that. We understood it was the same classroom hours, but they didn't feel like the same quality of hours to us initially. Initially. These were our initial concerns. The lab component wasn't going to work especially in labs where we had to grow stuff, right? How do you grow plants faster if you have a horticulture program? It was hard, right? So there are things that we, I mean, that was a genuine concern. Microbiology was another one, which was my area. So you'll notice this has a little bit of a science and math slant because those were the faculty that I was dealing with a little bit more closely. Cramming content in will not allow students to retain the knowledge long term. So they might remember it for now, but when they walk out the door, if they take that next class, they're not going to retain any of it. It was too fast. They're not going to know it. That was a concern. Courses that require practice for mastery will be rushed. So we think of like mathematics and physics and calculus, um, where you have to practice and those skills build on each other. So there was a concern about that. Our English folks were a little concerned. They wanted to hold on to some of their works of literature and were concerned that they couldn't fit those in in a short amount of time. How could you rush those types of analysis over time? 
We heard this, students don't do their work in 15 weeks, what makes us think we're gonna, they're gonna do it in seven? And I really, so, and, and yeah, it's, it's actually a little funny. Um, but I think it's a really interesting point when I heard folks on the panel this morning talking a lot about pre-work, right? How do we get them to do pre-work? Um, and how do we get them to come prepared for class? So I think the thinking is they didn't come prepared for class in 15 weeks. You know, will they be prepared in seven weeks? Where it feels like that's a little bit more critical, right? That feels more urgent that they're ready in seven weeks. I don't know that it really is. I think it's, I think it's urgency if they're not showing up in a full semester prepared as well. It just makes the slide longer and more painful, I think, in 15 weeks as opposed to seven or eight. When will there be time for both student downtime for students and faculty? It's a different pace for sure. Okay, no doubt it's a different pace. There was concerns about rigor. You're asking me to dumb down my classes to offer it in eight weeks. Grade inflation was a concern for us. So we also had, um, besides the um, compression, we also had added to our faculty evaluation a success criteria right about the time of the rollout of the 14-week um, or the seven-week compression. So there was a concern among the faculty that people would just inflate their grades so they would be evaluated well and then this seven-week thing would look great on paper when maybe it wasn't. Maybe students really weren't learning. And actually, it was more of a question of student learning. So there was concern about that. And then the last thing, and there, was some, there wasn't a lot of this, but there was some, you know, this is academic freedom, you can't tell me what to do in my classroom. We had some of that, and they stood on that ground for a little while. I think when you put the student at the center and think about their experience, some of these fall away. Not all of them, some of them fall away. So do some of those concerns sound familiar? Perhaps a little. Um, this was not exhaustive, but these were the top ones. It's a lot of top ones, I know. So when we started getting ready, so once the decision was made to compress, and we sort of, you know, got over and got started, Trident did some amazing things for faculty that made it go so much smoother than it could have gone. So one of the things was that as soon as the decision was made, the how was incredibly supported by the institution for faculty. The question was, you're not gonna do it this way, it's how can we support you to do that? They gave us professional development money, um, they went, shared information with faculty council, faculty colloquium. We had like professional development days. That was like a colloquium set up. Um, division meetings. So there was a lot of open meetings, listening, listening sessions, listening sessions for faculty so they could go talk to our AVP and our vice president of student service, or our vice president of academic affairs and student services and talk about what is really the most concerning things and what they really, really needed in their mind to make this work a little better and a little, and a little, because we were under a time constraint. We had about a year and a half. So the thing that we didn't have was peer colleges. So we also had, we didn't have anybody to go see. So they gave us a bunch of professional development money to go talk to folks or go to conferences, but nobody, in 2014, nobody was doing it across the board. Like we saw a lot of programs that maybe had done a program, but we didn't find colleges that had gone completely eight week across the board. There may have been one or two. So as far as information that was out there, we really kind of, we did our due diligence at conferences. We really looked more at course quality. That's where we spent our professional development money. How can we make our courses better and stronger? Um, learning things like technology, instructional design, how can we, you know, learn, we went um, to conferences on active learning, how can we put that information into our classrooms? Um, we had some release time to work on course redesigns, so we didn't have compensation, but we did have some time to do that. 
I mentioned we had PD money. So what we did in the science department, and I know other departments did it as well, we used a team-based approach around courses. So everybody who taught A and P got together, and we included part-timers in the room as well um, to get their input. And we did this for all the courses in science and math. And we sat down as a team, looked at the content. I heard somebody mention this earlier. We separated the must-haves from the nice-to-knows. Right? We all in our courses have things that we like to talk about. Maybe it was the focus of some research that you did or it's really interesting. We separated out the must-haves based on our competencies and the criteria for success in the course from the nice-to-knows. We looked at textbooks. We looked at chapters, sequences of chapters. We tried to pull apart things that we wouldn't put in the same week together. We used, we flipped some classes so they had some online prep before they got to us. We took a little bit more creative strategy to scheduling and scheduled for um, a lot of our science classes, we did an hour and a half every day to get our six hours a week in as opposed to two, three hour blocks. We gave them one and a half every day followed by lab. So it, they still had their time, but only an hour and a half was lecture. The rest of it was in lab. Sometimes we offered those all face-to-face. -face. Sometimes the lecture portion was online, and they came in only for lab. If that was the case, as many times as possible, we tried to get the same instructor. It was usually me, because I was one that really liked to teach those courses. So if I was the online instructor, I also tried to teach the lab. So that way, they saw my face every day. I got to see them, know them, so they weren't just a, a name in, in my course shell. I knew exactly who they were from lab. We didn't always have that luxury, but we did try to do that where it was possible. We did have a trial semester, so in fall 2013, um, so we started in 12. Fall 2013, we piloted some courses. We had, some, we had a little coalition of the willing, and they piloted some courses. We had students that took us up on it. Um, and we, it allowed us to start the iteration process. And I heard that several times from the faculty panel, and I think it is so correct about redesigning your courses like this. It's never done, right? Every semester, you're going to learn a little something and be like, you know, I need to move this quiz, or I need to not put a quiz before a, um, before a break, or, you know, you're just going to learn little things about how the students interact and engage with your course that is going to help you make it better every single time. For me, I enjoyed that. Maybe it's the scientist in me, but it felt fun to continuously look at my course quality, how the students interact with it, and see if I couldn't maybe bump up my success rates a little bit more in micro for the next semester. A couple other things they did that they have since gone away from, um, but to start, we had pretty high double sections, so they eliminated the double sections. So faculty were teaching only single sections of lecture and lab to get sort of smooth out the bumps in the courses before you offered them to more students. Um, and then we had um, two other things that we did more on the system side of the house. Marketing created a seat ready campaign for students. It had its own logo. It had its own color. It was all over campus. And it started with students with a little teaser in like June or July. And it said, all it said, all over campus, there were signs posted that said, change is coming. That's all it said. Kind of like winter is coming, right, for your Game of Thrones. I never watched it. I just saw it on TV. Anyways, change is coming was all across campus. And students were like, what is that? We're like, we don't know. You know we, we weren't going to tell them. So marketing rolled out. We had info sessions, I mean, we ha it, that logo was on everything. Pens, paper, there were signs all over campus, and students learned what that meant and what, their, what the start of their semester would look like, and sort of what, this, what that traditional 15-week semester would look like um, in fall 2014. Probably the biggest area of concern was financial aid um, reimbursement. We split it up. That's how Trident had, that's how we did it. I know other colleges have done it differently. Um, they split up their refund between the two semesters. So we front loaded their courses in term one. So they had more courses, so they got more money back. And then they would get the rest of their refund during term two. 
that was probably the biggest adjustment uh, because that impacts their, their living, right? Students were using that for food and housing. So that was a big one. So that seat ready campaign, when I said that communication is the most important thing in transformative change, that made it easier for students. They understood it by the time it started. And actually, we understood it better, too, because we went to some of those sessions. I told my folks, I said, listen, if students are going to go learn about it, that's a good spot for us to be so we know what students are hearing, right? We know what they're being told about this change. Um, and then we also held something they have also since gone away from. We held very tightly to our deadlines. So um, they, they, late registration, things like that, they put a hard stop on some of those and it made a big difference. It made just the flow easier. They have since gone away from it. If you look at success rates, they're not as high as they previously have been. They're still higher than they were, you know, as at the bottom of the trough. Um, but I think they have made some changes that possibly could be impacting their success rates a little bit. We had really good success rates in fall of 2014 with all of this extra attention on the student experience. And I think that's worth mentioning again. We had really good success rates when we were paying attention to the entire student experience, both in the classroom and out of the classroom, how we serve them from advising to financial aid to you know, counseling services, disability. We were being really intentional about connecting with students about what they might need as they transitioned into this change. And when we did that, our success rates were great. So, and Jennifer's gonna talk a lot of, of more about that tomorrow. Okay, so let me see how I'm doing here. All right, let's take, you know, I'll come back to this. I'm gonna come back to that. I wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the STEM adjustments that we made. Because STEM, they're all, all, of, all of the adjustments to courses are hard. But from my experience with STEM faculty, they, had a, they really struggled. They really did not feel like their courses could be. They weren't doing it in that um, format before the change, and they really struggled to conceptualize how their courses could look after the rollout was announced. In our gen ed side, you know, our English and human, they were already experimenting with lots of stuff. So they, they felt, even though they weren't pleased about it, they felt better prepared. Our STEM folks did not feel well prepared to do this. And I think it's the content and how we deliver it and how we've been taught. You know, a lot of times science and math education feels like a hazing process, if you ask me. Having gone through several levels, it feels like a hazing process. So I think that, you know, they just didn't feel like they were really well equipped to do it differently. So, we made better use of technology. Our LMS, we were Blackboard, I think, at the time? No, Brightspace, which used to be D2L. So that was our LMS. We also made use of adaptive courseware technologies from our um, publishers. We wore out our publishers trying to help us build the courses that we wanted for our STEM students. We had them in our offices constantly, putting on sessions for entire departments over certain courses. We wore them out, and they were happy to do it. Um, we also hybridized courses. I think I mentioned that. We also, I heard a term this morning on the faculty panel, engagement architecture. I like that. How you structure your course matters for students, especially students with busy lives, right? So as this, these courses are moving quickly, one of the things that I, and actually it helped me as well as my students, I made sure that, especially for my, actually it didn't matter if they were virtual students or not. If they were hybrid students or not, they had access to the same shelf. The content opened the same day every week. Their practice questions were available on the same day every week. Those closed on the same day every week. The quiz opened on the same day every week and was held over, I always held it over a weekend day in case that was the only time somebody had to do their quiz because they worked nine to five and, or, and then had you know, other life things to do in the evening. 
And then the quiz closed at the same day every week, and their grades were posted immediately. And then the next week, content, new content opened right away the same day, and we just repeated ourselves, except for if we had a short week or some sort of break thrown in there. But it was very, so we designed those courses so students knew exactly what to expect all the time. We kept it super structured, and that seemed to help students. Now, that's what worked for us. That might not work in your area, but that worked really well in microbiology at Trident Tech in 2014, and 15, and 16, and 17, and 18 until I left. Um, it worked really well. I mentioned that we scheduled class for four times a week for an hour and a half to break up the real content heavy. We used a lot of, I used a lot of daily assessment, low stakes daily assessment. So you came in, if you came into class, and this I pr primarily use with my face-to-face -face class, we had a quiz every day at 8 o'clock. If it was 8 o'clock class, every day at 8 o'clock, it was done by 8.10. If you were there, you took it. If you didn't, it didn't matter. You, so you had, to t you had to be there to take it. And I know that that's not terribly flexible. I get that. But when you give a quiz every day, we had a lot of quizzes. We counted the best 10. We knew that everybody has a bad day once in a while. Well, if you give a quiz every day, it gave you like four or five bad days, right? Days you didn't make it, days you just didn't, you weren't ready. So we did these low stakes assessments. And my, st I'm not a morning person, I will tell you that, but they beat me to class most days. They were there before I was ready to go, ready for that quiz. So, and you know, they were ready. Sometimes it was on material that we covered on the last class. Sometimes it was reading material I would push to them so they could have a little extra, you know, an article or something that we would work on. So those kinds of things. I had never considered, I never thought about my class. I'm just going to be honest. I never thought about it much differently. But this forced me to think about my class a little differently and how I could interact with students. Stu and, you know, they didn't love the daily assessment at first. Um, but after a while, they were, I mean, I had days where I walked in, I'm like, you know, I don't have a quiz ready, so, and they were like, but we're ready for one. And I'm like, wow. So then we'd have an activity. I'm like, okay, well, write down what you know. What do you know? What do you want to tell me? Send it to me. You worked, you're ready, let me know what you know, right? And I would still count that as a quiz grade because they were ready for me. All right, so I will do this one. Yes. Yes. Do I have that in there? Okay. So one other, before I give you a quick, another quick activity, I do want to talk about the, our decision to go across the board um, in fall 2014. We had every program, no exceptions for two years. Now, I should, I should, I'm lying. See, I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to lie to you. Some of our clinicals and some of our, like, externships that we couldn't make faster, um, those we, we left. But for the most part, for two years, every course in every program, fall 2014, was eight-week compression. However that looked to you, however you created your architecture for your course, that's what it looked like. For a couple of reasons, first of all, we were worried about doing a lot of mixed, you've got eight-week and then 16 weeks, and how that would be for students. We didn't want to create more confusion. The other was that it was a significant push on the student services side. Significant. Probably more, really, or equal to what was going on the faculty side. We just didn't fully appreciate it from the faculty side. And so for them to have multiple processes running, they, they did not, in that short amount of time, have a way to make that happen. So across the board, they made a massive shift to their processes and their structures so they could accommodate this change. So there were a couple reasons why we did that. They have since, Trident has since, started to um, offer a few courses back in 15 or 14 weeks. Um, two things I noticed as I was leaving in fall of 24, or 2018, summer of 2018, faculty didn't want to teach them and students didn't want to take them. Because we had been at it since fall of 2014. Students knew exactly what to expect in an eight-week term. And if they came from a high school that had blocked scheduling, it wasn't a big deal to them at all. I'm telling you, the population that will struggle the most will be the ones that are, you're going to catch in the middle. 
be ready for them and be helpful to them. But once you work through a cycle of this and students don't know any different, it's just how they take classes at WCTC. So really, once, we make that, once you make that change, you've got a little bit of a pain period, but it gets much easier on the other side. So I wanted to make sure that you understood that as well. Any questions so far? Okay, I'm only going to give you five minutes to do this because I have some data slides that I want to show you. So I want you to choose one dream change. I want you to think big on this one. Don't think into your, in your constraints. One big change that you would like to see, and it can't be not go to 18 week, or eight weeks. That's not your change, <laughs> right? That's not what you can, that's not an option. So what change would you like to see occur to make this work easier? Not just from the faculty perspective, from the advisor perspective and the counselor perspective and whoever else in support staff we might have in the room. What is that change? How does it improve your course or your area or help your students? And what needs to happen to make this a reality? I learned as we did this work that if you need something, ask for it because you never know where somebody might find the ability to help you out. Maybe they won't give you exactly what you want, but you might get more than you expect if you never asked at all. All right, so um, 10 after, we'll come back together, okay? You're not really late. You're just early for the next session, and you don't have to wait very long, right? By the time you get your paperwork and your financial aid, you're ready to start. Get your books, you're ready to go. So it takes away that you're late, you can't come back for 16 weeks, you're actually early for our next term. So let's get you ready and in a really good place to start eight weeks from now. Because we have a brand new session starting up in eight weeks. And that really helps with you know, equity considerations. It gives you some flexibility to help serve the students. You know, students aren't really different in, from state to state. They're, you know, we're all humans. We all, you know, they say students don't do optional. I don't know too many people that do optional, students or not. The other thing I was laughing at this morning when we were listening to the panel and how students don't do pre-work. So Jennifer and I, a little um, confession, are currently in a systems thinking course through Cornell. It's completely online. So we have to do pre-work and you know discussion boards and stuff like that. Well, our class closes at 11.59 this evening, tonight, and we, are, well, we will be sketching in on two wheels, most likely, to get all of our work done. So we are not, you know, students across the board are not all that different. Um, we don't do optional, we don't really do a whole lot of pre-work, so. Um, but when we think about equity and how we serve the different needs of our students, this is one new tool and one new option for your students to provide some flexibility. Um, they only take two to three classes at one time, which is nice, it's less to focus on, we found there was less absenteeism and fewer withdrawals. They stuck it out. You know, in, the, in our 15 week, by week 10, we were seeing the same thing that Amarillo saw. When life got in the way, they were like, oh, I can't do five more weeks of this. I got, I, and they would just drop out. But when you're at week five or six, and you only have a week and a half to go, they're like, I can do this. Or we can put a stop gap in place to help them get to the end. Right? So it gives them, you know, that I can do this, um, I, can, I can stick it out. We had more students completing. It actually increases the opportunity to complete 30 hours if you use fall, spring, and summer, which is a, we know, is a momentum metric for students to completion, completing 30 hours in that first year. So it actually increases the possibility of them completing um, you can do anything for seven weeks, that's that whole, I can, I can stick it out. Life happens less, but the effect um, was less pronounced. And then the other thing that students really liked was that Monday, it's at least our micro and science students, they liked that Monday through Thursday. We registered students for a whole semester, term one and term two at the same time. So we got them registered for a full semester, and a lot of times if you're smart about your um, strategic about your offerings, we would have Math 101 and 102 in the same time slot both terms. So they would just, 
their, their schedule was exactly, they could schedule for the entire semester and work out their childcare and work schedule around it. That makes it much easier for them. And they get two classes done instead of one. So some benefits for faculty. I know this is going to sound Pollyanna, but I am telling you the truth when I tell you my class was better after the eight-week compression. After the, you know, the shock of it was over, our classes were better. We had faculty doing things they never tried before. They were being creative. They were making use of technology. They had, uh, we were sharing best practices. We were visiting each other's classrooms. That wasn't happening before that. We kind of walked in, did our thing, and walked out, you know? So this was actually, um, it sort of breathed a little bit of new life into the way we taught courses at Trident. And so it also gave us an opportunity to create new processes. So along with the eight-week came year-round scheduling. So while we were making the eight-week change, we said, you know what, it would really be helpful if students could schedule farther out in advance. So, so shortly after we implemented eight-week, we implemented year-round scheduling. Because those changes aligned and fit together well to enhance the student experience. So sometimes these big changes help new changes come about that make the student experience better. It just fits. It makes sense to do it at that time. Some of the challenges, I'm not, so this was a difficult adjustment at first. Our evening population was severely impacted. That was unintentional and it was unanticipated. So you only, if you're a part-time evening student and you, especially our science students, and you want to take two classes, you could not do that in a compressed format unless you went online. You could not physically be in class between six to nine or, take, or even 10 and take two classes in the evening hours. And when we saw, as we watched our data over time, our evening population was tanking and we're like, what is going on? And we finally, you know, we realized what we kind of had, had said, this was something we probably should watch out for and it was problematic. So keep an eye on that. Um, part-time students, so especially for your part-time evening students, it is rapid motion. So we registered, taught, s turned in grades. Now the registration between terms is not terrible. That was something we were afraid of. It's like, oh my gosh, we're going to have to do fall registration all over again between fall one and fall two, right? We registered students for an entire semester. So really, between terms, the stragglers who maybe had failed a class but needed to repeat, they were the ones that we saw, but we had more time to see them because we didn't have that crush of students because we registered them for the, for the full term. Um, our out-of-classroom commitments um, can be difficult at first while you're getting used to this. So um, just keep an eye on that and think about, you know, I, I heard, you know, how you manage your time or how you value your time as a faculty member. I know you probably have some outside commitments, but leave yourself some space to make these changes. And then collecting meaningful data can be challenging because it's hard to isolate variables. Talking to my, you know, math and science peeps, right? It's hard to isolate variables. Um, so you need to be intentional up front. There is a lot. You can have the best eight-week offerings that meet every criteria and every single benchmark. And if students aren't getting their financial aid on time, they're still going to drop out. If, it, you know, if advising isn't working, they still, you still might lose them. So when you're looking at data, I'm just going to caution you, when you look at data from other colleges, there's probably, well, not probably, there is definitely a lot at play in what you're seeing for their success or persistence. So just keep a critical eye on that. Go ahead. Um, so, we, so that was one of the first places where we, we were allowed after the two years to put full term classes back, full, full 14 week. And then we offered more hybrid and mixed in the evening um, for students that wanted to take two classes. So we would try to, um, uh, if they wanted to take two classes, we would try to combine them so they had the option to take at least an online class if they wanted to be part time in the evening. That's a great question. It's a great question. Okay, some successes. So I'm going to show you some of our pictures, but students did better in courses. Our success rates went up. It's what we wanted, and it worked. Okay, retention is better 
for first-time, full-time students. It's still not great at Trident for part-time students. But they have not focused on the part-time student experience. And they will admit that. So when you focus on it, it probably will get better if you focus on it with an intentional eye. Okay, but that's just not something that they focused on. You know, most of our funding formulas are full-time, full, first-time freshmen, so the part-time students sort of get the, you know, the, they don't get the attention. Withdrawal rates were down. Grade inflation was not a concern based on, now this was sort of a, you know, we were, it, we were inferring from data that we were looking at. Um, it was hard to say if enrollment was impacted because we, impl so, you know, 2008 was when the recession hit and, and enrollment went through the roof for community colleges and then slowly it started to go down. In Charleston area, we were insulated from the decline for a long time, several years. While everybody else in the country was declining, we were not because we had Boeing move into the area, we had Volvo move into the area, so we had um, industry driving enrollment. When the trend finally caught up to us was shortly after fall 2014, so it was hard to tease those two, what was actually causing the enrollment decline. Was it eight-week eight compression, or was it the fact that people were just going back to work and we didn't have as many students? Um, so that was, you know, it was hard to say. Um, I think I mentioned already we had less, less absenteeism, and we had fewer full-time freshmen, first-time freshmen, unsuccessful in all courses. That was a problem for us. They would just drop all their courses, and that happened far fewer. So here is our success rate graph over time. So we were back up to the quarter system <laughs> success rates. So it made a difference for all students across the board. This was all success rates. So this was across the board success rate. I didn't have fall 2018, but those numbers just match the graph. So it went up for students in um, after the compression. So fall 2014 is when we flip the switch. Just keep that time stamp in mind. Based on demographics, so all students were doing better across the board, but three areas that we were very I'm excited about our first-time freshmen took a big jump. Our African-American students took a big jump. And our 0% expected family contribution on the FAFSA, so our low-income students, took a big jump. So we were making a difference in students that are typically historically underserved. So this was students who were unsuccessful in all first-term classes. So about a quarter, that's kind of a lot, right? One in four students just failing all of their classes. So from fall, after we initiated the change in fall 2014, it got much better. I don't know why there's an asterisk near fall 2017. I forgot to ask before I got on the plane. So I'm not sure what that means. And then this was something that we had a great, so this speaks to the, they won't retain their knowledge for the second course. So this was following students over a certain period of time in their cohorted courses. So they were following them in the second course. So reading 032 was a prerequisite to reading 100. Um, so the, so the uh, courses on the left are prerequisites to the courses on the right. And you can see that over time, after the compression, um, compressed format, those numbers went up. Math is still, <laughs> you know, we always said, you know, our success rates were great, thank goodness for the math department, because we were always above the math, <laughs> the poor math department, they were always much maligned. Um, there's just a couple other courses, uh, co course sequences with cohorted students, over, following them over time, following their success. Um, we were excited about the um, Math 102 to College Algebra, so the very bottom one there, Math 110 is our College Algebra. Students were doing better, that was, that's, that was actually really great for us with college algebra. Um, they're doing some different things now, um, but trying to get that up a little higher. Question? Were those success rates? Those yes. Rates? No, they were success rates. Completing both courses successfully. So students were retaining and completing the second, retaining the knowledge to be successful in that second course that followed. On the, on the previous slides with success, uh -huh. can, you, can you define that on those slides too? Like a, a ways back, like maybe three or four back? Yeah. 
So this is A's, B's, and C's in the classroom in their courses. Course success, yes, course success. Sorry about that, absolutely. Yep, no problem. And then this is just a little bit more of successful persistence. Um, and I know it's probably a little small to see, but these are some of our, like, Bio 101 and 102. Bio 210 and 211 is A and P 1 and 2. Um, astronomy typically had a pretty low success rate. So not perfect, but better after the compression. Do we still have work to do? Yes. I said it earlier, and I'm going to say it again. It's not a cure-all, but it does improve success. Students were graduating at higher rates. Again, there's still work to do with the graduation rate, um, but it made a difference in successful persistence to completion. And then I just threw these um, grade distribution slides in. So <clears throat> because of the success criteria and um, uh, the compression sort of happening simultaneously, this was a big concern at our institution. I didn't see it show up at, at here on your list of concerns so far, if, you're, if it is. So when we looked at it, we expected to see over time, if we were bumping students to pass, we expected to see the Fs bump into either the D or C range, right? We expected to see that sort of subtle shift into the just barely successful. But what we saw was students were getting more A's and B's and fewer Fs and Ws. They were withdrawing at much lower rates and they were more successful overall. You know, and from my own experience in the classroom and micro, students did amazingly well with this. And my success rates were higher compared. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen here. Oh, this is, sorry, this is just, I borrowed this from Trident. Somebody was really trying to make a point here. <laughs> sorry, I'm not sure how long this is going to go on. Wait, okay, we're done. Okay, so that was just the grade distribution over time. They also looked at final exams, same final exam for Psych 201 before and after the compression to see if students were still learning and performing either the same or better. So were students not doing as well on comprehensive final exams? The answer in Psych 201 tended to be no. And then, <clears throat> you know, Spanish, our foreign languages was another area that we had. So that was sort of that building competency and how do you do that in a shorter amount of time? So they had some, um, they tried some different things, and <clears throat> I think they finally settled on a couple different options for students based on what they were comfortable with as far as taking courses and if it's online or if it's face-to-face. -face. Um, but students in general were completing Spanish 101 and 102 at similar rates, um, their averages um, on their final exams. So we did not see what seemed to be a clear lack of student learning from the eight-week format. And then our persistence went up. So again, you probably can't see the number specifically, but our full-time, first-time freshmen were at about 77% here, and up in, the, uh, in fall 2014, we were at about 88%. Again, this is when we were really focusing on every part of the student experience, really intentionally. Everything from what went on in the classroom, to what advising looked like, to how we were marketing to students, to what our, how closely we were sticking to our deadlines. When we were doing that, our persistence was really high. Students were having an experience that was more momentum and less loss, and we were keeping them. Um, so interestingly enough, let's see. Was it this one? Hang on, it might be this one. This is, so this is fall. This is fall to fall, so I'm sorry, I'm going to go back here to fall to spring because I want to make one point here. So you see where retention sort of took that dip there in fall 17? And so I called my girlfriend who works, who's the director of IR, and I said, you know, what's up with fall 17? And she said, that was, and I totally forgot because I was, um, I just forgot. Um, that we, had, we started a bridge program with the College of Charleston. So this is fall to spring retention. That bridge program was a one semester bridge for students. And if it, we were successful, they would start in the fall and transition over to the College of Charleston in the spring. They were never intended to persist fall to spring. So it impacted our fall to spring retention rates. They have since figured out how to tease that out, 
But this is, again, this falls under the sort of be careful when you're looking at um, success rates or persistence rates because there could be something going on behind the scenes that impacts it that really um, doesn't have anything to do with the success. Um, so again, this is not a standalone silver bullet to success or a retention issue. It's a piece of the puzzle, right? There's a lot that students experience at your institution that could cause them to stay or could cause them to go, to have momentum through their experience in their journey or be lost. So this is just one really so far that we can tell successful piece to that puzzle for students. And there are many parts to the student experience and the entire experience should be considered holistically. So I know that's not your scope right now to consider the entire student experience, but I know we have counselors in the room and I know we have folks from other parts of the college in the room. And so how a student holistically experiences your institution is gonna matter. And I know Jennifer's gonna talk a lot more about that tomorrow. So overall, we had better courses. We talked to our colleagues more and had better articulation with other departments and other divisions. I never had so many conversations with the nursing department and I was, doing, I was teaching pre-nursing students and before the, I had never really had a conversation of is it important that I teach the viral life cycle. But after I was forced to turn a critical eye to my course, I was like, well, is this really important for students as they move on? Or, so we had those conversations. We made better use of technology, which allowed us to have a little bit more creativity. We had built in some flexibility for our students. We had better course success, fewer withdrawals, better retention. And I really felt like I knew my students better. I saw them every, well, Monday through Thursday. Actually, if I'm being honest, most of them stopped by on Friday anyways. They were like, hey, I was just on campus. I thought I'd stop in. So. I felt like I knew them better. So this is possible. And on the other side, it actually looks pretty good. Um, I, but I hope that I, you understand that I recognize this a lot of work, um, but it seems to me you've got a great start already based on what we've heard so far. You've got some almost experts already doing this, and I think you should look to them, right? Ask for the things that you need, but please don't lose sight of the fact that your course impacts not only your students, but also your institution. It makes your institution a better place as the students move through on their student journey here. So I am happy to take any questions. Um, I know you're probably hungry and tired of sitting, um, so I am done. I know the health science faculty are staying, is that correct still? And I will be here if you have any questions or need a card or anything like that. Have a great day. <laughs>